keto freaks, this is Carl. Do you or someone you know have trouble focusing? You know what I'm talking about. You sit down to read something, try to figure out your monthly budget, write that novel you've been putting off, or maybe you just can't seem to do one task at a time. Well, you may not know this, but I'm a musician as well as a software developer. Programming is a job that requires focus, long periods of uninterrupted work. It's hard for them and for you. I've created music to code by. This is music, yes, but it's specifically and scientifically designed to promote focus. Studies show that when math students were exposed to Baroque music between 60 and 80 beats per minute, they did better with comprehension and testing. So I created more modern music that is neither boring nor distracting, but falls within that tempo range. It's just the right mix. I also made the pieces 25 minutes long. That correlates to research that shows we all get brain fatigue after 20 or so minutes of hard focus. The result is thousands of happy customers. Now, you don't have to be a programmer to reap the benefits of music to code by. It has been known to soothe restless pets, calm fussy babies, and even help autistic kids relax and fall asleep. Listen to some free samples at musictocodeby.net. Welcome back to Two Keto Dudes. I'm Carl Franklin in Connecticut in the United States. And February 1st, just this year, I put myself on a ketogenic diet to take control of my metabolism. And in that time, I managed to reverse all my markers of type 2 diabetes with diet alone. Hi, I'm Richard Morris in Canberra, Australia. I've been on a ketogenic diet since April of 2014. And when I started, I was very sick with complications from type 2 diabetes. Within six months of starting a ketogenic diet, all of my biomarkers of disease had disappeared. And we're going to share the progress of my journey through ketosis and Richard's experience thriving for years in nutritional ketosis. Yep. And hopefully that might help a few people who are curious about this kind of dietary hacking. Yeah, we're not doctors. We don't want to give anyone any medical advice, but we are keen to share our own experiences. We're actually both software developers, so we're not afraid of a little technical detail. Nope. Uh, we've done some research into our own deranged metabolisms and the science behind that. Uh, we hope to share some of that research. Where possible, we intend to put links in the show notes to cite the research supporting any claims that we make. And you'll probably work out pretty quickly that we're both foodies. We love to cook and we love to eat. Yeah. So we're going to share the great food that we can eat on this diet. Every episode, both of us will share yes, a recipe. Will for an essential keto meal that we eat regularly. So let's start episode number 14. The Tom Show. The Tom Seized Success Story Show. The Tom Show. Yeah, it's the Tom Show. We're going to bring on a special guest here in a minute, but uh, before we start, do we have any corrections or apologies from last week, Richard? Yes, Carl, we actually have quite a few. Quite um, a few. Let's see, quite a few. Let's start from the top. So I said that the Romans discovered that fasting cures epilepsy, but apparently it was a Greek, a Greek doctor in the Roman Empire named Galen of Pergamon, <laughs> who was just the first to write down that the Greeks had originally discovered the link. And he noted that in his, in, in his book Epidemics, Hippocrates, who was – the father of medicine, described the case of a man whose epilepsy was cured with a drastic diet and fasting. And Erasistratus, a Greek anatomist and royal physician under Seleucus I Nicator of Syria. Now, I'm sure I've got that name wrong. I I'm, apologize I'm to sure. any historians. But uh, he stated that one inclining to epilepsy should be made to fast without mercy and to be put on short rations. <laughs> so... Uh, yeah. Okay, and also we said we'd talk about consuming ketones, you know, ex external ketones, but we never did. Yeah, we might do a whole show about supplements or something like that, uh, things that we take, and uh, we did, might do that later on. And just to clear it up, there is evidence that the mere presence of ketones in the bloodstream is beneficial for controlling some kinds of cancer, and we encourage you to listen to the cancer show from a couple of weeks ago about that. 
However, taking ketones isn't a shortcut to ketosis. It's nice. kind of like instead of going for a run, you just cover yourself with sweat. <laughs> so you get to the end product, but you don't get the process. And the process of burning fat and creating ketones is where the magic happens. Yeah, absolutely. That's why it's good for us, for certainly for, for losing weight. Yeah. Also, I mentioned that mitochondria are organelles in every cell in the body. But yeah. uh, but as you pointed out, Richard, there are some cells like red blood cells that lack a mitochondria, which is why they can only ferment glucose for energy and are unable to use fat for energy. Yes, that's true. And uh, and I guess that's it. Yeah. Okay. Well, maybe this week we'll have uh, we'll have a few less <laughs> apologies to make. <laughs> exactly. Uh, all right. So just to recap, the ketogenic diet is where you restrict carbs. You really want to restrict as much as you can, but incidental carbs are okay, like green leafy vegetables and nuts. That's right. Yeah. We eat enough protein to maintain our muscle mass and everything else uh, comes from fat, either on the plate or from that Krispy Kreme we ate a decade ago. That's exactly <laughs> right. Yes. We're pretty much fueling on fat. So, how did you go this week? Um, I had an I had an interesting week. I uh, I've been putting on weight slowly and uh, over the past maybe two months or so, and so I decided last Sunday that I would start using a food diary again, mm. which, which I did for like the first eighteen months of my two year so far journey, two year mm -hmm. plus a month journey. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, so I. For the past seven months, I've not been doing a food diary. My, my whole my whole goal here was to get to a point where I could just instinctively eat when I was hungry, yeah. stop when I was full, and pretty much stay healthy and maintain a, a, a good weight range. Okay. So I just started gaining just a little bit of weight, and so I went to uh, uh, a food diary and started putting my food in. And uh, it's interesting because when you actually are forced to write something down, you um, it forces you to, to, to look at what you, you're right. doing, sure. you're eating. And so, um, so I found some interesting things. Um, I found that I was eating almost 20 uh, grams of carbs a day that I didn't know that I was eating. Uh -oh. And this was just in one type of salami that I was getting. Uh, I just thought, hey, it's salami, it's keto, it's good. Right. But this particular salami was like ten percent carbs, so you know. I it guess was, it was cured with sugar. You said. Yeah, it, it, it was. It was. It's. A, I guess in America you'd call them slim jims. In Australia they're called twiggies. Oh, those things are terrible. That were, yeah, but some are good and some aren't. And oh, okay. When I was doing my food diary for the first eighteen months, I was eating ones from Coles, which I'd have two or three a day, you know, and they had like or two percent uh, carbohydrate content, so they were great. And then I found a cheaper source at Costco and I thought, oh, these look even better and they taste great. Wow. It was only when I put them into the food diary, I used a barcode scanner, it came up and said, hey, it's 10% carbs. You've just oh, eaten 2.3 carbs. <laughs> wow. So, so you were yeah. you were getting 20 grams that you didn't know you were getting. Yeah, exactly. So uh, wow. so that was interesting. And and the other thing that was interesting is I got my I got my medical results. Oh, cool. So yeah, I get my annual uh, medical checkup around about April. Yeah, I'm still not diabetic. <laughs> yeah, that's um, good. Yay. <laughs> my, my, my HbA1c, which is a measure of uh, three months glucose control, is 5.2%. Very which good. Which is uh, exactly what it was last year. I've been there pretty much for um, 16, 17 months now. So Great. Um, that's that's a, an ex extraordinarily tight uh, range of uh, glucose control. I, so the other interesting thing was that I got a lipoprotein subfraction analysis, and that's where you, where they don't just measure your LDL and HDL, but they measure all the different sizes of the particles, and they tell you whether your your LDL, for example, is predominantly small and dense or large and fluffy. And it turns out that most of my LDL is light and fluffy. So that's awesome. It means that I'm doing the right thing. And it also validates the science that Volek and Finney and those guys have done uh, about cholesterol. Exactly. Yeah. So I'm, I'm happy. I have a you know, moderately high um, LDL number, but uh, as we've seen when, when we spoke about statins, there's uh, doubt about whether that means anything unless you know the subfractions. And my subfractions indicate that that high number is... Uh, is fairly benign, so that's a good thing. Uh, plus, I did a 50k ride again this week, so uh, uh, I did that on Saturday. And at, on my ride, uh, going in the other direction, I saw the former Prime Minister of Australia riding his bike. So, All right. <laughs> so there you go. Fantastic. Well, that's you so must live in a nice neighborhood there, Richard. Yeah. <laughs> 
So I live in the capital city of Australia, so it's really Australia's version of Washington, D.C., so it's, right. it's a company town for politicians. Right. So, so Carl, how was your, uh, how was your week? Oh, pretty good. You know, like I said, I had been in a plateau for a while, yeah. and I just decided over the weekend that I was going to do a, t- a three-day fast, which turned into a two-day fast, but uh, mm-hmm. just went to keto after that, and I had a day of keto today. And I'll weigh myself tomorrow, but I'm I'm already feeling stronger and better, and the the two day fast was wonderful, and uh, I just can't get enough of it now. I think I'm addicted to fasting. Is that bad? <laughs> no, that's not bad. <laughs> so you just come back from Belgium, right? Yeah, that was so hard. The land of chocolate and beer. <laughs> Let me tell you something. Uh, I was a speaker at this conference, and looking at the food that they put out, the people who put out the food were basically trying to kill me. <laughs> they were trying to kill uh, me. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it was all much. pastries. Uh, I mean, the coffee was coffee. Okay, no problem. Yeah. But, you know, pastries, ice cream. I mean, they their breakfast was just all pastries oh, dear. everywhere. And that's it. And uh, lunch was, you know, there was a burger with cheese and some mayo. And that's about all I could find that wasn't garbage. And then... Um, You know, dinners were okay. Uh, I found this really great Moroccan restaurant and, uh, you know, lots of olive oil and meats and sausages and things. And that was really good. So I ate there a couple Mm. of times. But anyway, I came back and, and, uh, you know, I had put on a couple of pounds just because it's just so hard. I didn't eat anything crappy, but there's just not enough fat. That's the problem. Yeah. You know, when you don't have the, the ketogenic ratios and you don't eat enough fat, you get hungry. Yeah, that's right. So I went on this fast. I'm going to weigh myself tomorrow. So I don't really know at this point how, how I'm doing, but I'm feeling better and I, I feel, you know, lighter and thinner and in more control and all of that stuff. So Yeah. Now that's awesome. Yeah. All right. Then it's time for Mail. We're just Oh, we love this mail. 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 Okay. This is a a long email we got a few days ago from one Chris Pappas, and he asked several questions, but it was more about ratios and things like that. And he says, tonight I cooked Richard's pulled beef recipe from Easy Low Carb. It was incredible. And as I was pulling the beef, I ate some, then some more, then some more. Okay, so I had about 400 grams of beef, which is about 150 grams of protein, (laughs) and I have some questions. I haven't eaten anything else other than the beef in 24 hours, and I feel full. Should I also eat some fat to balance my meal, or is that just silly? I mean, I was going to force down an avocado to get some good fat in, but I thought, why eat if not hungry? Yeah. This got me thinking about meals in general. Is it important to try to get the ratios balanced every meal? And it's exactly what I was just talking about with, uh, hmm. you know, when you when you when you're hungry, I like to satiate it with fat. Yeah, you know, because that takes care of the problem. So he says, if proteins turn to glucose in the body, and they do after you've got enough protein to satisfy your muscles, then yeah. if I have a zero carb day like today, is it okay to eat a little extra protein? Like today, I'm aiming for 100 grams or less a day. I guess you wouldn't recommend it, but my point is if you have an extra low-carb day, is it okay to indulge in a little extra protein? Um, So we should answer these questions one at a time. First of all, the first one, uh, as I said before, if you're not hungry, uh, Richard, you can tell me if I'm wrong about this, but if you're not hungry, you shouldn't eat, really. No, pretty much. The, The hunger is your body telling you that it's running out of energy. Yeah. Um, so if you if you're not running out of energy, you don't need to eat food. Uh, and the difficult thing for us it really is knowing the difference between being hungry and just wanting to eat something. Yeah. And you know sometimes you're not particularly hungry, but you just feel like well, you want to eat something. But, well, that's psychological hunger, and you really don't want to give into that. Um, but if you're really feeling hungry, then your body's basically saying, look, we're at DEFCON 1, and if you don't feed me something, we're going to go to DEFCON 2, which is where I, I, I cut back on all non-essential uses of energy. Mm. And that's where your body stops heating and, and your lower met- your metabolic rate goes down. Yeah. As Dr. Fung says, you know, the, the whole point of weight loss or the, 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 the biggest effect in weight loss is keeping your metabolic rate up. Right. If you can keep your metabolic rate up, you're going to lose weight quicker. 
Right. So, um, so yeah, if, if, if you're hungry, if you're really hungry, you should definitely eat. And um, and there's nothing wrong with uh, with having a fat bomb or something just to make sure that you're, uh, um, it, you know, if you're really hungry. But if you're just psychologically hungry and you need to learn the difference between those two, um, then don't give in to that. Right. And the other thing is about extra protein. Uh, extra protein isn't going to raise your... Um, insulin a lot. It's going to inch it up, but it's not going to raise it a lot. Yeah. Um, carbs is going to definitely raise your insulin. So it's always safer to go with fat because that has no effect on your insulin level. Yeah. But, you know, a little extra protein is not a problem. And, you know, we have hinted at uh, on the protein show that extra protein might actually be hard on your kidneys. Yeah. And while it does make the kidneys work a little harder, we don't have any evidence as far as I know Richard that there that you can ruin your kidneys with extra protein no. if you have damaged kidneys to begin with however that can exacerbate the problem yeah that's a good reason to be on a lower protein version of a, a ketogenic diet also if you're type 2 diabetic you're more likely to make uh, protein into glucose and so um, if you're type 2 diabetic, you really want to be on the lower end of the, the protein scale. But it, it really, there's a range there. You can have anywhere between uh, 0.8 and 1.5 grams of, uh, of uh, protein per kilogram of lean body mass. And so, and within, right. that, within that range, is, uh, it, you know, it's pretty good. All right. Very good. Cool. So, yeah. So uh, he says, thanks again for such a great podcast. I have to tell you, I love it when one of you talks about food and the other says, nice. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> he says, I can hear the drool. Hope you're not offended by that, but I'm a foodie too. No, and I no, know exactly what you mean when you say nice. Cheers, Chris yeah. Papa. Oh, thanks, Chris. That was awesome. Yeah. Thank you, Chris. Um, we uh, appreciate the email. If you have something to say to us, it's dudes at twoketodudes.com. Um, leave us a comment on the website, twoketodudes.com, and definitely uh, leave us a good review on iTunes because that helps people yeah. find us. Thank you very much. All right. Now it's time to announce our special guest, is it not? Yes. It, he's been sitting there listening for the whole process so far. I bet you he's busting to say something. Right. So let me just give you his quick story here. Tom Seast is a software developer from Illinois, and 17 years ago, he injured his back falling downstairs. He was always active before the injury and completely stopped all exercise after the injury. He put on weight, a lot of weight. He estimates he was over 500 pounds. I say he estimates because he couldn't find a scale that went up that high. He started on an Atkins diet in 2009 and was down to 490 by the end of 2010. He tried various combinations of low-carb, low-fat, and low-calorie diets and uh, in April 2011, he took his first bike ride since the accident and went two miles. But by the end of that month, he was up to 20-mile rides. Since then, he's logged 21,700 miles or so and has cycled all over the U.S. and in many other countries. Uh, he managed to drop about 200 pounds with a combination of diet and exercise. But then he heard about this thing called the ketogenic diet. He started to read books like The Big Fat Surprise and all this other science that came out and that said, you know, fat isn't a problem. And in January 2015, he went all keto and has taken off an additional 90 or so pounds. I'm going to let him tell the rest of the story. Welcome, Tom. Yeah, welcome. Hey, thanks for having me. It feels good to be a lighter person. It's funny that you were always an active guy and then hurt your back and just you couldn't move a whole lot, and yeah, it's it's amazing how that can just happen to somebody. Yeah, my, my active lifestyle really started as a kid when I started doing paper routes when I was five. Um, we lived in a small town, and I would go up to the grocery store and get my papers early in the morning, and I would run around on my bicycle, yeah. and uh, I, would, I would drink two Mellow Yellows, which um, – <laughs> If people in the United States would know that it's similar to a Mountain Dew yep. and, and usually consume a bag of candy or two. And I'm not talking the small bags. I'm talking whatever was a good value. Sure. And uh, the sugar really never affected me. I mean, I was always chunky, played basketball, played just about every kind of sport through high school and then got into golfing and uh, bicycled up until the day I got married and quit biking and then when that incident happened, um, I really, really got heavy quick. Yeah. Uh, I was a dot .NET uh, access programmer at the time moving into .NET, and uh, my boss at the time 
would have me stop and buy two dozen Krispy Kremes every morning on the way to the office. Oh, oh Krispy Kremes. <laughs> a, a dozen was for everybody else, and a half a dozen was for me, and, and I got the leftovers. Oh, yeah. Jeez. Um, and so I still remember the last time I tried to weigh um, on the way back from the airport, on the way home, I stopped off at a Jenny Craig. Uh, which was a chain of weight loss places over here. Yeah. And um, right. I uh, walked in and you could see dollar bills flashing in their eyes. Sure. And I yeah. said, I want to weigh. And they had two scales that would, they were sitting next to each other and the total, they would go up to 500 hmm. and uh, they couldn't weigh me. I was above 500 somewhere. Wow. And uh, none of that really affected me until, um, I mean, I never had issues where I would have to go to a doctor or anything. I haven't had a family doctor in years. Did you measure your blood sugar or anything? Nope. Nope. Um, I had um, no reason to. Um, like I said, I, I, other than just being heavy and out of breath all the time and, and feeling really sluggish, I, I, um, I still, you know, I was, I was functional, uh, but barely. Yeah. And then I took a contract that required that I drive an hour and 45 minutes each way. And what I, what I would find is that by the time I got home, my knees were so sore that I could hardly walk. From driving? Uh, just from all the sitting and the driving, correct. Wow. And uh, the last straw was when I had to have my little boys at the time take my shoes and socks off at night. And that was enough for me to finally get off my duff and uh, start dieting. So I wonder, you did Atkins for a while and you were pretty successful on it. And what made you look around and think maybe, you know, I should do a low fat or calorie restricted diet after doing Atkins? It's all the bad bicyclist influence. Yeah. <laughs> I, did, I, it, I hate to say that, but it, it really is. I, I started with Atkins and that's how I got below 500. And, right. and, and, and if you've ever done Atkins, you know, that's a lot of work. And it, it took me about yeah, a year and a half, yeah. probably. So were you not eating enough fat, basically? Right. I was a lot of protein. Um, very little carb, of course, but you know, I was overdoing the protein, obviously. You know what I mean? You look kind of for the leaner meats and stuff. Right. And, you know, it's, it's a different mentality. But I, I mean, here's the thing is Atkins originally said you should eat fat, but I just don't think people took them seriously. No, I mean, we've been taught to fear it over here. I don't right. know if it's what it's like across the pond, but over here, I mean, oh yeah, we were just taught to fear it. And um, so, yeah, when I got into the bicycling, I, you know, I started logging, you know, as of today, I've logged 1,919 days straight on my fitness pal. And, you know, I would watch the other guys and they would be doing low calorie. And I thought, well, you know, I'll try that. And, um, and how'd that go? That was torture. Um, yeah. yeah, it's awful. Isn't my it? absolutely, my absolute worst year of weight loss in the time that I've been losing weight was the year I gained probably twenty to thirty pounds, trying to maintain an eighteen hundred calorie uh, for the uh, limit for the day. Wow! And uh, you know, of course, at that time, you know, I was doing carbs again because you could do them, and of course, you're just hungry nonstop. Right. And uh, yeah, I'm riding riding, you know, four, four to 5,000 miles a year. And so, you know, you add that on top of it, you're going to be hungry anyway. Oh, you're starving. Yeah. Yeah. So I had a brief uh, time where I did GAPS. I don't know if you're aware of GAPS, but it's an no. elimination diet um, that people do. My wife had done GAPS. Uh, you, you kind of eliminate everything. You start with broth and then uh, you start adding foods back in. And I did GAPS. Uh, more or less to support her. Um, now, what's the point of what's the point of that? Is it to find out what foods affect you negatively? Yes, exactly. So you start with broth, you clean yourself out basically, and then you start adding in things like tallow. And uh, it's it's you know if if you've got some kind of allergies or something, you know I highly okay. recommend it. Yeah, it'll pick them up. But uh, sure. what I found is that I I didn't really have any, <laughs> <laughs> huh. and. Uh, Except carbs. You're allergic to carbs. <laughs> yeah. Like we all are. I, I was going to get my life insurance renewed, 
And over here in the States, they don't like you to lose weight if you're doing that. Right. They, If you lose weight, they view that as highly risky behavior, which is humorous. And That's really tough. funny, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> so I decided to go on a year's worth of maintenance um, so that I could get my life insurance rewritten. And then in October, um, I started doing research on various options. And my uh, first book that I listened to, I, I do audio books and podcasts mm-hmm. for my education. Yeah, me too. The very first book that I that I found to be a really eye opener was The Calorie Mess by Jonathan Baylor. He's at Microsoft, right? Yes, he's a Microsoft dude and um has a podcast and uh, very very informative and you know explained all the science behind calories and calories in, calories out and calories are hard to count, so why bother? Well, it's sort of the idea that a, a calorie isn't a calorie. It's where it, what it comes from is just as important. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, great, great read. And then from there, I went to The Big Fat Surprise was my very next book. Oh, yeah. What a great a book. book. And, yeah. And that one was an eye-opener. I just listened to that on the plane to and from Brussels. And what's great about that book is that she she cites the studies, and then she digs into them. Nina Teicholz we're talking about. Yeah. And she digs into them and finds out where the, A, where the conflicts of interest are, and B, where the science doesn't hold up. And and she does go deep. So conflict of interest in, in studies is a big problem. Um, and it's basically big corporations that want to hire a scientist to find out if their product is safe. And if the scientist comes back and says, no, it's not safe, then they ignore it. And if it's if they can find a, a angle to say that it is safe, or that it's beneficial, or that it isn't harmful, or whatever, then they amplify it up and then tout it. Yeah, it's it's not just uh, big business either. It's actually scientist egos. I mean, there are oh, yeah. uh, Ansel Keys buried the uh, Minnesota coronary experiment right. data for for many many years, and it was only in the last couple of years of his career that he sort of let it out in a in a in a in a otherwise unknown. Uh, journal and sort of tried to pretend it didn't exist because right. it didn't you know it 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 proved his hypothesis was incorrect. Right. We're still running on this hypothesis now. The Framingham study was another one. Um, and we'll post links to all of these stories so that you can see yeah. them for yourselves. But all right, I, I didn't mean to derail your story there, Tom. Oh no, that's fine. That it was a real eye opener for me because you know we have this impression in the United States anywhere that is, you know if the U.S. government endorses it, there's good science behind it. We pretty much follow that. Yeah, I mean the Ansel Keys stuff had no science behind it at all. No, I mean, right. it no. literally was just observational data, um, and he cherry picked that. So that was an eye opener. But at the point, I, at that point in time, I still had no idea. That there was this low carb, high fat ketogenic diet. Right. And I discovered that in October, pretty close to my birthday, when I was riding, I was out riding my bike and I was listening to a Jimmy Moore podcast. Uh, I discovered Jimmy and yep. um, he had on two guests from Omaha, Nebraska, and I don't remember their names and I don't even remember the podcast episode, but I remember that it was. An old guy in his 60s, which is old compared to me, I'm 50, and then his wife of 58, I think, and they would get up in the morning and they would drink this concoction called Bulletproof Coffee, and then they'd go ride 150 miles without stopping for carbs. (laughs) Yeah, right. And (laughs) and when I heard that, I was just floored. And I was like, I've got to figure out what that is, because... At my weight at the time, I was stopping every four miles to eat right? because I was so worried about bonking. And, you know, you're trying to do 40 miles, you're stopping 10 times. I mean, you have a food wagon. You're hauling a food wagon on your bike just to stay yeah. Yeah, right. functional. So that was my – it was odd that that was my my main desire when I found the diet was really to just get away from having the carb load for bike rides. So it was about exercise performance, really. It, which is funny, you know, um, at the time, you know, I was in pain and didn't realize it. Um, you don't realize it until you go on keto and then you don't, you realize in the absence of pain, what pain is. Yeah. Um, and so I went with my son, we, uh, we flew into Santa Barbara, Mexico, uh, sorry, Santa Barbara, California, and we rode our bikes to Mexico. And on that trip, 
I listen to Keto Clarity and a few other books. Hmm. Um, and at that point decided when I get back, which was right before Christmas, that I would start the ketogenic diet. And I did, and I've never looked back. That's great. And you, you talked about how everybody's sort of brainwashed over here. And it's not just in the United States. It's the whole world. It, it's the civilized world. Yeah. The um, it, it, A couple of examples just from our conversations here. Richard's uh, LDL is really high. His doctor's all freaked out. But he did a particle test and found out that he doesn't have harmful cholesterol. It's all beneficial. And um, the other thing was me. When I had my blood work done, I went to my doctor and she gave me a high five for dropping below diabetic levels sugar-wise, but said, your LDL is through the roof and I'm freaking out over here. And I said, well, why? You know, where's the science? I said, can you show me the science that says that this high LDL is going to lead to heart disease? And she looked right at me and said, no, I can't. And then I said, well, then you're a doctor. Why are you why are you telling me this is a problem if you don't have the science to back it up? And she goes, you know, I can't argue with a guy who brings me studies. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so she said, I'm going to go read this stuff and I will then I'll get back to you. Meanwhile, I've got a um, carotid ultrasound this week. So by the next show, you'll know the uh, results of that. But wow. it just goes to show you that everybody's sort of taking all this stuff for granted. I can't tell you how many family members have wagged their fingers in my face saying, you got to not eat fat. You know, you got to watch out for that fat, your cholesterol and blah, 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 blah. And it's like, what? show me the science or shut up. I, I get people saying, you know, I approve of you lowering the amount of sugar that you've got in your diet, but really you shouldn't have so much fat. <laughs> and I'm like, <laughs> yeah, no. I know. No, you don't get it. Yeah. All right. So. So the, a couple of things. I've noticed that people who go on Atkins don't really take what the doctor said to heart. He did say, eat fat, eat lots of fat. Fat is good. He even has a thing that called the fat fast, where he says, you know, take a whole week and eat nothing or th two or three days and eat nothing but fat. If you're on a plateau, he, sa plateau, he says, yeah. you know, eat, have a fat fast. It, I, think, I think it wasn't until Nina's book that we really got over this whole fat phobia that we've got. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And and Atkins pushed against this all the time. Because, right. Because, you know, he used to have people calling into his – he had a radio show in New York. Right. And where he'd talk, talk about all kinds of bariatric dieting and, and cardiology and what have you. But he'd have people calling in and just abusing him for totally. giving people so much fat, you know. Well, it's good to see that uh, it's happened and – this happened pretty quickly, um, this additional 90 pounds. But you said that since you've been doing the keto and having, having adding more fat back into your diet, uh, uh, can you feel the difference? Yeah, and, and let me be clear. Um, you know, people, you got to keep in mind, I'm a very, 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 very patient person um, because I... I um, I go more based on how I feel. I mean, if you you know, you got to keep in mind, I I dieted for a year and a half without being able to weigh. Yeah. So to me, the scale means nothing. Yep. I mean, it's I I I have one, but I I don't. I'm not a scale hawk. Right. But I I did weigh when I started um, the ketogenic diet, and I was at uh, if I remember right, it was three sixty eight. I think that's right where I was three sixty six. And I'm I'm like at two I'm around two eighty five now. I haven't weighed in over a month. Wow. Um but when I started keto, I did not lose a pound in the first three months. Wow. And and you know, I, I wasn't on Facebook, so I wasn't in any of the groups, I wasn't I wasn't out there complaining that I was stalling. Right. Because literally after the first week I felt wonderful. Yeah. And so I was focused on feeling good and getting adapted. And so if I got hungry, I would, you know, we talk about keeping things simple. I'd literally slice cheese and put butter in between cheese and I would eat butter cheese sandwiches. That's great. And, you know, and I would do egg fast and stuff like that. And then uh, after the three month mark, I just started losing weight like nuts. Yeah. Um, wow. wow. And, uh, but yeah, talk about, you know, within two to three weeks, uh, I was all of a sudden I'd wake up and realize, no, oh, I guess I was in pain. I don't feel pain anymore. Yeah. Not hungry. I mean, it was just really weird. 
<laughs> I, I actually noticed the pain when I had a, a fall and I, I, I like I, I didn't realize I was in pain before keto. I went on keto and then one weekend at a wedding, I accidentally ate half a pavlova, which is a an Australian dessert made out of sugar and egg white, really not keto. <laughs> and uh, But I'd also had a, a few drinks and so you, you tend to make these bad decisions when you mm. uh, have a few drinks. And uh, the biggest effect for me uh, was that that night I could not almost I could almost not sleep because of the pain in my knees, and I'd not felt yeah. this for two years. Right, and so I must I must have been chronically in joint having joint pain. Uh, to, exactly you know, the same when for I was me. So much car- carbohydrates, and then, and I didn't really notice that going when I went keto, but boy, I noticed it when it came back. I noticed it when it came back. Yeah. And, and what it is for me was getting out of bed in the morning and walk that walk to the bathroom. Oh man, that you just got to limber up a little bit. Like it, it was really stiff walking down the stairs. It was really, really stiff before, you know, and I noticed that after a couple of days on keto, I was like right up out down the stairs, just feeling great. Well, I was noticing it after my bike rides because it used to be, you know, I'd go bike 30 plus miles and I would come back and I'd have to take a nap. And then, you know, by the next morning I'd wake up and I'd feel okay. Um, now, you know, I can go ride 50 to 60 miles. And if, uh, if I haven't done it in a while, I'll need a little bit of a nap, but I'm never sore. Yeah. Um, and literally I could get back up. So like this last weekend is my 27th anniversary. I ran up 88 kilometers, <laughs> um, on Friday Wow! and felt no pain, took a little nap. It's incredible. Really? And then the next morning did another 50. Yeah, it really is. So Tom, what do you eat? Uh, well today, let's see today is, is in a classic day. Uh, I got up this morning, um, and I have. See, I got to think about this. I had two, uh, three adapt bars, uh, Dr. What? Westman's adapt bars. Yeah, what are they like? Uh, they're primarily coconut MCT oil based. Um, and the reason I had those is I got up for church late, and today was Mother's Day, so I went to church with my wife. And um, so I had three adapt bars. And then at uh, mid afternoon, I had a burger um, with cheddar on it, a burger patty with cheddar, asparagus, and nine pieces of bacon. Nice, mm, nice. <laughs> That's lunch. <laughs> and, yeah. and then right, and then right before <laughs> here, this this call, I had tea with turmeric and cinnamon in it, and four tablespoons of butter. Lovely. And that's my consumption for the day. And then I only rode uh, ten miles today. Um, we had we had really bad storms here last night, and they blew a bunch of trees down on the trails. I was actually riding in for the Mother's Day lunch with my wife and kids, and uh, I was going to meet them in there. And uh, a guy and I were lifting logs off the trail, and I re-injured my back. Oh, so I rode the rest of the way in, but they, I limited it to ten miles today. Um, so you find that you generally eat more in the middle of the day and less toward the end. You said that was classic for you. Is that a typical thing? No, typically I don't like during the week, if I'm going to an office, uh, I, I'm an independent contractor. So I have, you know, uh, let's see, probably three or four clients at any given time, but about half my time I'll go to the office on the days that I go to the office, I'm almost always intermittent fasting, which means I usually don't eat anything for breakfast or lunch, and then I'll have a two-hour eating window at night, and then I go to bed. Now, when you Uh, say this is funny, because we have talked about intermittent fasting a lot, and when you say two, are you eating constantly for two hours, or do you just typically eat one meal? Just eat one meal in that two-hour period. Yeah, that's what I thought. And that's more of a social thing than anything. My, uh, My wife likes to have dinner together. Sure. As a family, I... She's gone this week, so uh, I may I may do an extended fast like you. My very first fast was forty two hours. Wow, cool! Um, oh, and that was just curious, total curiosity. I just wanted to see if I could do it. Yeah. Uh, 
it's amazingly simple on on keto once yeah. you're adapted. Really yeah, is. Once you can burn fat, you know, fasting is extremely simple. I, I remember my first fast, which was I think seventy two hours, and I didn't think I'd ever, I didn't think I'd be able to do it. I thought, I thought going into it, you know, I'm not going to be able to do this, but let's see how far I get. And I was surprised once I got over that sort of twenty four hour hump that you, you get a bit of hunger at twenty four hours. Yeah. After that, it was just gravy. It was just really easy. Yep. My eating's always been emotional because as a as a kid, you know, you always ate when you had food and you know, my parents weren't yeah. wealthy by any stretch. And uh so to me it was always an emotional barrier. I mean, I always ate to avoid getting hungry and yeah. uh, that was evident. Uh but like you guys always said, you know, I've got boxes of Krispy Kremes laid away that I can still <laughs> use. Uh, right, yeah. I'm I'm down to about eighty pounds of them left, but <laughs> ah, <yeah. laughs> So you're about 280 now? Yeah, somewhere between 280 and 290 would be my guess. Um, like I say, I don't I don't weigh that often. And you don't you don't get your blood work done. You never never seen it. Oh no no no! I, now I've done that a lot. Oh, I am a data hound. So yeah, I've got <laughs> join the club. What what basically what happened is when they came out and did the insurance, they did blood work on me. Um, and uh, so I have all those blood results before I did keto. And then, of course, when I started keto, I bought a ketonics, and then I bought a Precision Extra. And I have um, about a year and a quarter of spreadsheets where I have all my <laughs> blood glucose reading. Welcome to three programmers go on a diet. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, and what's, what's funny about it is I've come to the determination that it doesn't matter. Um, yeah. But it's fun. To, it's fun to log it. It's kind of like. My fitness pal, you know, I, I don't I don't rely on the information, but I, I like logging it. I like having the trail. Yeah, um, yeah. I like the discipline of having to do a diary. And then uh, I did a I did a podcast series with uh, Brian Williamson of the Keto Evangelist, uh, where he coached me for eight sessions. Hmm. And and so I did I did a round of blood test during that, and then I did a full panel. I paid for it myself about uh, let's see March eighteenth. So I have my numbers um, from those three separate blood tests. Did you do a, a, an LDL particle test? Yes, I have all those numbers. And they're all good, obviously. Otherwise, you'd be complaining about them. Well, I, I'm not the type to complain, and, and I'm like <laughs> you. I, You know, my, my main indicator when I wake up in the morning is if I feel good. Uh, that's what I go by, but... My A1C, you know, keep in mind, I was probably pre-diabetic. I don't, I don't really know. Right. Uh, when I started keto, when I started keto, I would have readings in the 130s and 140s. Um, but you have to go to a doctor to get diagnosed as pre-diabetic, and I didn't do that. Yeah. yeah. And um, so, like, the uh, my reading this morning and my glucose levels 84. My ketones were at 1.2, and oh, I was uh, nice. flashing, flashing free red on the ketonics. Um, but my A1C was 5.1. Um, Great. That's awesome. Let's see. My, my insulin was 4.6. Wow. Wow. My, my, uh, let's see what else. I mean, I could read them all off to you. No, if that's, you to that's know. enough, oh, man. My triglycerides were 63. <laughs> oh, great. That's, that's outstanding. Outstanding. Yeah. My my insulin I, the, in my test I just got was twenty, um, which is quite high, and that's a fasting insulin. So, um, you know, I'm still quite quite. I'm st- underneath. I'm still insulin resistant. The fact that I don't uh, have a a diet that that requires a lot of insulin means that that's not really a factor for me. But yeah. uh, underneath, I still am quite insulin resistant. Hmm. The only the only thing that was a negative. That I that I was concerned about in the blood test at all was my liver enzymes. Two of my ten markers were off, and that's a that, you know it's a stress related problem for me. I get a lot of stress with clients. Um, you know they're deadline oriented and stuff. Um, we wouldn't know anything about that, will we, Richard? <laughs> no. <laughs> so I, I up my liver enzymes, and I'm pretty confident that. Uh, 
you know, they'll self-correct by the time I get tested again, which I'll probably now, do. It. How does one up their liver enzymes? This is a new one on me. Um, I, what I did was I, I have a really good naturopath by, chiropractor who will be seeing me tomorrow to uh, adjust my back. And uh, he's made, in the past twice, I've gotten hemorrhoids. And what most people don't realize is a lot of times hemorrhoids are being caused from uh, liver inflammation. Hmm. And so in the, in the past, he's prescribed, which isn't really a prescription, they're over-the-counter supplements that are food supplements that up your liver enzymes. Hmm. And so what I did when, when I, every time I would get the hemorrhoids, he'd just say, you know, buy these two things. And I bought them. This time I didn't even go to them. I just bought them. And then I bought milk thistle and uh, one other. And that helped? Oh, yeah. I mean, I feel a lot better. Okay. Um, you know, I, I haven't been retested yet. And I probably won't till the end of June. So, Tom, we were hanging out on the Two Keto Dudes Facebook thing today, as uh, we are wont to do. And somebody mentioned fiber. And I have been taking um, the, the psyllium husk gel caps daily. And I found that if I didn't take them, that I would get uh, bleeding. You know, and I wouldn't, I didn't know right. if it was hemorrhoids or anything, but I did have a colonoscopy and I know this is getting all sorts of fun for everybody now. Um, I did have a colonoscopy. Three, three, pro three no. programmers get a colonoscopy. Yeah, welcome to three programmers get a colonoscopy. <laughs> <laughs> no, so I, 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 that was clear. So it was obviously anal fissures or, or hemorrhoids or one or the other, right. but but then um, I think you and, and Brenda Zorn both brought up the fact that, well, fiber is a problem. This can be a problem. Uh, too much fiber can be a problem. And, and I guess you mentioned a, a book or a website that's, uh, um, I can't remember, what it's was guthealth.org or something. The, the book's name is uh, The Fiber Menace. And I, I read that for a while and it seemed interesting and, and some stuff made sense, but then it sort of went a little surreal on me, and uh, it began to sound like, um, you know, uh, snake oil. But I, I don't know. There must be some truth in there somewhere. It, and it makes sense because uh, fiber like that is required when you're eating starchy carbs to just be regular. But I never really thought that uh, on a ketogenic diet, I, I, I wouldn't need them. But it makes, you know... I think about Jason Fung, who says, you know, the body is intelligent. Why, you know, if a caveman wouldn't need psyllium husk pills, why do you need them? You know, this is the kind of thing <laughs> that goes through my mind. It's like, what are they doing? Grazing on grass every day or eating rope? You know, that no, they're not doing that. So why do I need it? And it's true that if you get enough fat and oils, then, then after a couple of days uh, without extra fiber, you become regular and all sorts of good things happen. But did you, did you think that was part of the problem too? Um, I, it's been my observation, and, and but it's not something that I track. I don't have a poop spreadsheet. <laughs> um, you know, it, 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 it's funny because they make an app for that, but uh, I, I have yet to buy it. <laughs> Poopology. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I tried to get on the, you know, where they use, the, what is it, the Roche, I forget the name of the scale. It's like Roshak or whatever it is. Yeah. Um, but it's, to me, the, the thing that the book, my, my, my indicators are the longer I'm keto, the less I have to worry about fiber. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so I don't worry about it. I used to worry, you know, that I wasn't getting enough green leafies in a day. And um, I just don't have those issues. My, my issues are more with, uh, what I call food pollution if I eat out. Right. Where, like, I don't, I, I have a very bad disagreement with soy. So, like, they'll sneak soy oil in something. Mm. Oh, yeah, because it's cheap. Yep, I'll have, I'll have the opposite problem. I'll be running and screaming. Um, yeah, okay. <laughs> but normally, yeah, normally it's not an issue for more, me. Normally, I, I just don't need the fiber. Um, All right. So, it's, it's, it's one of those things I think you just have to experiment with. Um, right, yeah. It's, uh, but I agree. I mean, what, one of my one of the things that Jonathan Baylor said in his book, which really was to me intriguing, was you don't see animals sitting around with spreadsheets counting calories and trying to calculate their TDE. No, you're so and, right. You know, their their BMR exactly. 
you know, and I, and I, I ride by these cows on my bicycle and they're not out there in their little sweatpants on treadmills trying to maintain weight. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and, and so it's got to be something else. I mean, you know, this food system that we have. Well, we, and, we're, uh, we tend to think in the West that, you know, we have dominion over nature, right? God told us that we have dominion over all the animals, you know, it's like in the text of our civilization. And so we right. think that, that we can outthink the body, you know what I mean? Because yeah. obviously the brain is more important than the body because we have this, you know, this Hellenistic sort of culture. But uh, obviously, we have to overcome that mode of thinking a lot. I, I thought about this when somebody told me, a vegan told me once that, well, science has shown that the human body was not built to eat meat. And I said, well, first of all, you're wrong, because take a look at yeah. your chops, number one, and compare <laughs> them to a cow, and they're a lot different. Number two... I know that my body was made to eat. I instinctively know. And this person said, well, how do you know? And I said, because I like it. Exactly. What, what, <laughs> what more evidence do you need? I smell meat cooking. I'm like, oh, I want some of that. You know, the bear doesn't eat leaves because he's worried about cholesterol or whatever. No, we're built to enjoy eating meat. I like it. That's how I know. You know, and if, if you're, if you think paleo, which I, I like to eat paleo just because I think of it as a cleaner diet. Yeah. If you think paleo and then you take the, like the biblical background that I'm raised in, you know, we'd all be nude vegans. Yeah, right. Because, you know, there wasn't any death of animals and, you know, you can't adapt. And, uh, so if you believe in a creator like I do, you, you say, well, God created you to adapt. I mean, he obviously, you know, whether you believe we evolved this way or we were created this way. Here we are. You know, we are designed to burn two types of fuel. Yeah. Um, and that's because if we, you know, we don't always have carbs available, so we got to be able, you know, the body takes care of it for me. But yeah, none of my cats, you know, they they don't track the stuff. Nope. Now the the data is fun <laughs> because once you normalize, you know, I've yeah. I, like you, you guys have talked about exogenous ketones. I've tested exogenous ketones because I've had months of what I would call normal keto eating, and then I'll introduce something to see if it makes a difference, and I'll look at the data sure. and say doesn't make a difference and so you can have fun with it right and as you know with the meters you can test different foods um yeah but you have to be careful with that because it could be nothing i mean uh yeah i know that tomorrow morning i know for a fact that tomorrow morning my blood glucose level will be around 110 yeah it has it has nothing to do with uh you know this morning is 84 now why do i know that because I have to get up earlier than I normally do to go to the office. Yeah. Just that little stressor throws it up a little. Yeah. And so what do you do? You just don't worry about it. You know? <laughs> That's pretty much it. It, it. It's just cortisol. Your, your, your body needs to wake up, so it needs a quick spurt of... Uh, of uh, exactly. glucose, and so you you make it's a stress, it's a fight or flight flight response, and you make uh, your your adrenal gland produces cortisol, and that causes your liver to make more glucose, and you'll have it's also called the dawn effect. But for me, I like I I only had four and a half hours of sleep last night, and and I felt it very strongly this morning. Yeah, normally I'll have like seven hours. I I have less than I used to when I before keto. Uh, for some reason, I can make do with about an hour less of sleep a night. But yeah, if I if I if I really shortchange myself on sleeping, then I'll I'll have high glucose. Yeah, yeah, that and that happens when you travel too, especially jet lag. Sure. Well, Tom, thank you for geeking out with us. It's been fun. We're just about out of time, but I feel like we could talk for another couple hours, especially you know, <laughs> uh, on this subject. But uh, now I think we have to move on to a little segment we call Recipes. 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 Carl, what have you got for us today? Well, first of all, I'm hoping Tom can share something that he uh, cooks or oh, sure. eats. And uh, he said that he could, but it might be a little basic, but we'll see. I have two things. Okay. Why don't you go first then? But I, I, I have a tendency to keep uh, very, very basic things because I, I, I track things, and it's easier for me to track things that I've already eaten. So yeah. I have a water mix that I make where I use uh, sweet drops that are kiwi, strawberry, strawberry kiwi flavored, 
and I mix that with watermelon stevia. Oh. And I make a really, really sweet vitamin water, and it's my favorite vitamin water mix. And I can send Carl links to link in the show notes. Definitely do that because right. yeah. I, you know, that's one thing we miss a lot is that fruit. You know, we don't yes, get that. Yes, and that 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 curbs my sweets. Uh, I mean, I can sweeten that as much as I want. If I want a little sweeter that day, I just up the watermelon stevia. And uh, you can also mix in, uh, like if you want to up your salt a little, you can mix in a little sea salt or, or potassium real salt. or something. Yeah. Yep. And uh, even some lemon. Uh, so that's a basic water mix that I do. And then I have one fat bomb that I consume twice a week, and it's usually after a long ride. And that is I'll mix eight ounces of cream cheese with some heavy whipping cream. I don't have an exact measurement, but it's usually. Um, I'm going to say maybe a half a cup of heavy whipping cream. Yep. Heavy whipping cream. And then I mix in, uh, a small, small amount of raspberries or blackberries and I blend it. Oh, nice. And I stick it in the fridge for about, uh, I'm going to say about a half hour and it firms up nice. And it just, to me, it tastes like a raspberry or a blackberry cheesecake filling. Nice. Hmm. And and that's it. That's all I got. I mean, other than that, you know, cheese and butter sandwiches and bacon. There you go. <laughs> Spending cream cheese on bacon. I'm I'm thinking of using crispy bacon like crackers now. You know, uh, I've actually ordered it and used it to, to dip in guacamole. I mean, it's it's wonderful for everything. Bacon it is. is wonderful. Lovely. It's a wonderful food. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, I go next. Thanks, Tom. Um, my recipe is. Uh, basically sodium citrate based cheese sauce. This is total, Ooh, yeah. total molecular gastronomy here, but sodium citrate is this stuff that you can buy. I bought this 600 gram or 21 ounce, uh, container of it, um, for about 17 bucks off Amazon. You only use like an eighth of a teaspoon. At once. It's a white. It's a white powder, isn't it? It's like yeah. uh, baking powder. It looks like baking powder. Maybe a quarter of a teaspoon at once, but essentially, yeah, it looks just like salt or baking powder, or any of those things. Basically, what you do, you put that, you know, quarter of a teaspoon, I think it is, in a pan, saucepan. You add just enough water or beer hmm. to cover the bottom. Just enough to cover the bottom. You bring that to a simmer. You add eight ounces of shredded cheese, and I like to use cheddar, of course. That's my favorite cheese yeah. sauce, cheese. And then you just melt it all and stir it, and you you know what I do with that stuff? You remember McDonald's used to have these burgers called Cheddar Melts? Oh, yeah. I've never had one. They didn't have them in Australia. Tom, you know what I'm talking about. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So they had a rye bun. And then they had a burger and this cheese sauce and then grilled onions. And they were the best burger I've ever had at McDonald's. But, you know, it's that cheese whizzy kind of cheese, right? Right. So that's what I do. I make Oopsie Bread buns and I add some caraway seeds to them to give me that rye flavor. And then I will cook up a, a burger in butter and add some onion powder for my onions or if you're really feeling adventurous. Onions do have some sugar in them. So you, yeah. you can't use too many of them, but I'll just use a little onion powder and then just a big blob of that cheese sauce right on top. And if nice. you let it cool a little bit, it sort of sets, it sort of gels. So what does the sodium citrate do to the cheese? Because, I mean, you're just making melted cheese. So no, no, no. you just use melted it cheese? It binds it together. Like it, it makes it stringy and goopy ah. and, you know. Oh, interesting. It stops it from splitting too. It stops it from splitting. So yeah, if you melt yeah. cheddar, it all just sort of falls apart. This emulsifies it and just turns it into mm. this lovely, wonderful sauce. Nice. Nice indeed. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Chris Pappas is probably drooling right now. Yes, I'm sure he is. So Richard, what's your recipe? Yeah, I've got a simple one today. It's almond meal polenta. Now, polenta is this this Italian meal that you make from basically corn grits, I guess. Yeah, it's like and grits. It's a, it's a porridge and you have to basically stir it over heat for like an hour mm. and people build up massive muscles from doing this. In fact, you can buy devices. Of course, you can buy devices to do it. Right. But um, it's got a lovely flavor and texture to it, which is really quite quite delicious um, with uh, andouille sausage or uh, uh, chorizo sausage. It's yeah. It's absolutely wonderful. So so it, a lot of people, you know, you miss you miss the feeling of these sort of carby sort of starchy sort of meals 
And so uh, this is a, a simple recipe. It's on my website, easylowcarb.com, and uh, I'll link it in the show notes. But it's basically polenta. And the way that you make it is that you you take uh, about 100 grams of almond meal or almond flour. It's kind of the same thing. It's just ground more fine. Um, and you put it in a small saucepan and you add about a cup of water and you're basically making a porridge. So you put this sauce, you whisk it until it's it's lump free, and then you put it on a medium heat, and you you basically stir it while the while while you're giving it some heat, and um and and you keep whisking it while it heats up, and um it, it, you know that you got it at the right temperature is uh, when if you stop stirring, uh, it starts to bubble, and so you know you got it at the right temperature. So you're really trying to get all the water out because it, it solidifies is what's going on yeah. here. And yeah, it you, you, it's congeals. basically it's, it's it really it's turning into a it's it's turning porridge. into a porridge, and yeah. then and then you add cream cheese with about thirty grams of cream cheese and about sixty grams of grated parmesan cheese. Wow! And uh, you add that to it, and you know you can add a little bit of uh, add a little bit of salt as well, just to taste. And when you take it off the heat, the meal, the almond meal, thickens up. And it's cheesy and it's delicious. Oh, and yeah. basically you can serve that with vegetables or with you know with a really spicy sausage like an andouille or or a, a, a chorizo sausage. It's delicious. Wow, that sounds amazing. So there's my meal, polenta. Almond meal polenta. <laughs> That's great. Well, I, yeah, it's time to eat. Let's get out of here. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to have to become a foodie. Tom, thank you very much. It was great hearing your story and congratulations on your continued success. Thank you, Tom. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's been fun. All right. And, of course, you can talk to Richard and me and Tom just by joining the Two Keto Dudes Facebook group. Just ask for access and we'll let you in. And, hey, of course, if you have anything you want to tell us, something we said wrong, something that you don't agree with, some more research that you found to support or refute what we've said, send it by email to dudes at twoketodudes.com or post it on our website. Awesome. All right. We'll see you next time. Keto on. Keto on. Bye-bye.